I'm Leslie Millett. Thank you for joining me and welcome to my programme today. You're listening to Radio JCOM, broadcasting on 1386 on the medium wave and on the internet at www.radiojcom.com. The whole of the programme today is, is going to be based on the recent trip to Auschwitz and Krakow, which Ronnie, Gillard and I were privileged to be part of. So my first guest today has to be the wonderful Eric Hirsch. Hello, Eric. Hello. Thank you for coming in. Um, you certainly were the most important part of our trip that we had to Poland and to Auschwitz. How do you manage to still go back to Auschwitz and Poland? Um, I started it uh, about the year 2000 and uh, I carried on with taking young people, 50 at a time, and um, I went out with with 50 uh, children twice a year. And um, then slowly, slowly I started taking adults, and now I take one adult a uh, lot and one children a lot. And um, I just do it. Because ours was a bit of an unusual one, our trip, because we were not all... Jewish together, yeah. we had I think about ten or eleven non-Jewish people. With how did you think that 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 went? It was an excellent trip. People said what they had to say, and we we're all a very good group. You said to me that you lost a little something every time you went. What what did you actually mean by that? Because it must be really hard for you to go back. Yes, to go to Auschwitz is a situation. I always hits me every time I go back. I was there in the war time and, and I suffered a lot there and uh, I went through living hell in that place. And it always reminds me of the situation when I go back. Mm. I can't help it, but that's what's what's happening. But you also um, were amazed by the actual physical numbers of people that are, are visiting now. I mean, when we were there, there were about 500 young people from Italy. There, there were a lot of people. I think, actually, we were the last people leaving Birkenau. We, we were there right until it had gone dark. But you were amazed by the numbers. Yes, because um, years ago, we didn't have a quarter of the numbers which are coming now. Now there is big queues, long queues. People come from Sweden, from Germany, from from Italy, from Poland, from all over the place. I think when I was there in Auschwitz one, there was about thirty five coaches. So it's a very good thing basically for that so many young people go and see it and also adults. Mm. And um, I think there was a group of um, army from somewhere as well, weren't yes, there? Yes, yes. Do you think it's because of these sort of um, the films that have been made, like Schindler's List and The Boy with the Striped Pyjamas? Do you think that sort of brought awareness? Yes, yes. In a way, people are still learning about it. They teach it in schools, and uh, I myself go around to schools, universities, and I give talks. Actually, I'm going tomorrow to to a prison where they hold asylum seekers. Asylum seekers. And mm. um, so I'm going to two of them tomorrow. Because, I mean, you must have been practically the equivalent of that when you came here. I mean, you were brought here after the war. Yes, but I, I, brought, I was brought with 300 children. With 300 children. To the Lake District. But we were chosen by the British consul and um, from Theresienstadt. And there were 40 girls and 260 boys, and uh, we were brought for recuperation to the Lake District, and we were there for six months. Do, do you think that, just to go back to these films, were they realistic when you've sort of seen Schindler's List and, and, and The Boy with the Striped Pyjamas? Um, Schindler's List was basically made in Plashov, that's just outside Krakow. It's very, very much as it was, uh, what I remember. Everything what uh, Steven Spielberg has made is a very much 
part of what it was. Exactly, yeah. mm. exactly how it was. I know when we actually went into Schindler's factory, I was, I expected to just walk straight into this huge staircase that you see in the film. And in fact, it wasn't that at all. I was a bit disappointed. I know that sounds terrible because you shouldn't feel disappointed, but it wasn't quite as I'd expected it. No, because the stairs, they're on the other side of the building mm -hmm. and they made this into a museum. It's basically completely different now than it was. was. Mm. But there are certain places still, the factory is still standing the same one and uh, the stairs are still the same, but they've just been taken to the other side. The public does not go in. But I have been up the stairs and I've been quite a few times up the stairs to the real to real McCoy, but now it's made into a museum. Made into a museum. It's very different, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. So what about the future? Do you think that you will keep going? Yes, I hope to to do a certain amount. But the the view that we got was from a survivor and there were other groups going round that, that didn't have somebody like that with them and I think that they probably didn't get the same feelings that we had. No, because um, if you've got the survivor, uh, we can explain to you every detail, actually how it was. But uh, if we go with a guide, Polish guide, you don't get the same situation. Absolutely. I mean, I must admit that the guide that we had in, in Auschwitz was, was quite good. Yes. But you sort of, you know, he kept turning to you to sort of tell, tell us more. And, yeah, and, yeah, because... Uh, I usually get handed over anything they want to ask differently. They ask me because I'm a veteran of it. You're a veteran? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah. obviously your life did change forever. The scale of the loss of life, I think that w until you actually go to Auschwitz and, and Birkenau, you don't appreciate what that scale is. No. It takes you completely over once you get there. Mm. And uh, with the queues and block 11, that's where they used to shoot the people and um, prison them as well. Uh, it's a completely different thing altogether. When you actually go to the places in Birkenau and so on, mm -hmm. uh, it's got a great impact on you. Absolutely, absolutely. Eric, thank you very much for coming in today and hopefully the rest of the programme will reinforce um, your feelings. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. And that was Eric Hirsch, and I'm now joined in the studio by Gilad and Ronnie. Um, and just after we came back from Poland, uh, we went on Gilad's programme. And now, Gilad, you've had time to digest what the trip meant to you. What, what stayed with you now? I think that what usually stays with you after a few days is especially the feelings you don't really think about the places, you more contemplate the, the feelings that you had while you were there. And my feelings were, I think the strongest feeling was that we are so lucky that we are here, that we were born in the right time and not 60, 70 years ago. Because when you think about it, it's just faith, because you, we could have been there just the same. So I just feel very lucky. I feel we are all very, very lucky and privileged. And Ron, our, our daughter Esther, um, we were speaking to her after we came back and she said that you should let it go with you but then you should park your thoughts after a few weeks because it, and go back to them. Do you agree with that? Well, yes and no. If you can, you do. But the reality is you don't think the thoughts, the thoughts think you. You've no control over, or not or very little control of what comes into your consciousness. And what sort of stuck with you now, Ron? I'm unhappy with the modern approach to to the Holocaust. Um, it, it's so sort of... I know it sounds terrible, but it's so, oh, woe is me and how terrible. So totally unlike the attitude of Arek, sort of, I've got an issue here, I'm going to fight it, I'm going to survive it. Uh, and that robust, in-the-face response seems to be missing these days. However, um, Eric said that he felt that, that um, Schindler's list was, was quite realistic for, for what went on. What did you think when we went to the factory, Gillard? Actually, I felt that, I don't know, maybe it was the guy that we had or the fact that we had to run very quickly from one place to the other. I thought it could be much more meaningful if we had the time to, 
to wander around by ourselves and take our own time. I wanted to break out from this. Yes. I wanted yes. to walk more by myself. And I thought it looked more like a museum than the real thing. That, that was my feeling. Well, it was a museum, wasn't it? Yeah, but it was supposed to be based on something that is real because it was there, this was the right location. And it felt a bit like, well, we, we sat in Hebrew like a pharmacy. It felt like a pharmacy mm -hmm. in a way. <laughs> Absolutely. But we were also had the honour of having a wonderful woman who spoke to us, Ron, which you found very, very moving, which was, I think they call it a righteous Gentile. Yes, well, that brings me back to what I was saying just before. This lady had a, a sort of an inner strength, a, a, a sweet smile with stainless, with a stainless steel interior. You could see that she had this strength, this immovable attitude that she was going to be sweet and charming, but there was an inner core that she would fight any issue, any evil, however large it was. I think we need to explain, Gilad, what, what, what the righteous Gentile was. The righteous Gentile in general are people who helped along with their families for Jewish people during the World War II to survive, whether by providing them with shelter or food or just hiding them from, from the Nazis. This specific one, her name was Stefania. Her and her family helped Jewish people to cross the river and basically to be hidden by their family. For, was, for years, wasn't it? For years. They took a constant risk. Daily. Right, just daily. Mm. Minutely, if you can say, because the minute they are caught by the Nazis, there's only one thing that can happen to them. They are all being exterminated on the spot. After torture. After torture. So mm. this is not something that many people would do. And I think we spoke about it during the Holocaust trip. How would I react if I was a Jew in the Holocaust, if I was a German person in the Holocaust, if I was a Christian in the Holocaust? What would I do? Would I help other people survive? Would I only try to to release myself from to the horror? To save yourself. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, the, the the mix of the trip anyway, Ron, I mean, how did you feel? I mean, Eric thought that the, the fact of having Jews and non-Jews together was actually a very good thing. It certainly put a different flavour to the, to the trip because at the outset you're just a little bit cautious about what, what you say because there's no doubt that uh, the history of the Christian church uh, was one of, over the centuries, was one of anti-Semitism. And there's further no doubt that that provided a fertile bed, if you like, for anti-Semitism to arise in the last century. Uh, so how did I feel? Well, on the one hand, you feel you don't want to say that bluntly because it's an insult to people who are, after all, innocent. And, of course, there were many, many, many decent Christian people who helped Jewish people. But at the same time, you feel, in this issue of all issues, why should I be constrained and restricted in what I, in what I think and say? Well, I don't think anybody was. Do you, Eric? I felt that the Christians, and especially the Jewish people, felt quite quite free to say whatever they felt. But Ronnie does have a point when he says that, you know, it's there. You have Christians and you have Jewish people. He has a point. Next year, you're doing another tour, I understand. We are trying to get a, a new one uh, in March. It was funny, the, the minute we landed here, Stephen Pactor said, OK, when is the next one? And Arik was the second one to say, OK, when are we going next? It was quite amazing because... He keeps going. Yeah. I asked him as well today. <laughs> yeah. But he does keep going. You know, so it's, it's, um, I, think, I think it's amazing that he comes back from four days and the first thing that comes to his mind is, OK, when is the next time I'm taking more people to give them what I got to give? Absolutely. Fellas, thank you very much for coming in and talking to us. Um, and I think that as the programme goes on, we're going to interview people who have actually been with us other than us. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. And my next guest is Richard Rose. Hello, Richard. Morning. Thank you for coming in today. Um, we talked quite a bit while we were on our tour. And I'm sure you felt, as I did, that we were privileged to have Arik. Do you think that, that your life has changed a bit since you've been? Has it affected you? It's definitely affected me. 
uh, reading in books uh, about what happened sort of desensitizes you and when you actually go out there with Eric and you hear the stories and not only did he tell us stories but when he told us them of certain incidents that happened in the exact spot that it happened it sends it, a chill up your spine it doesn't does it? and then you see the enormity of it being at Birkenau you just you just see how absolutely colossal it was you know, murder on an industrial scale, something you don't actually perceive from a photograph or a book. You've got to see it with your own eyes. And that's really, really affected me. When we actually got to Birkenau, Eric, you took us up this tower. Eric, by the way, is back with us again. Um, and you took us... We went up a tower that looked out. When you actually got to Birkenau, did you get that vast impression that we got because when we got there it was just like huge we couldn't believe the sight well uh, there were about a hundred barracks in Birkenau and those were all taken down after the war by the Polish people because they needed wood in the winter time to heat the houses but um, those which are still left well there's only about six barracks left. But the uh, enormity was just uh, incredible how big it was. Auschwitz was about 30 kilometers big, had a lot of soup camps. And um, Birkenau was only part of Auschwitz. It was a huge, huge uh, encampment, which had a lot. Uh, we were all separated by electric barbed wire. We had to stay confined to this place at all times. And uh, it was huge, huge. It's just, uh, just impossible to describe it. So, Richard, when we actually got there, we seemed to have a sort of a build-up to what we were doing. I mean, we started off in the Jewish quarter. We, we discussed the fact that we thought about how people could actually live there now, let alone then. I mean, the Jewish quarter is practically non-existent and yet when we got to the actual graveyards they were frightening I thought you know sort of chunks of gravestones stuck into walls I really appreciated the uh, history that we learnt from Mark about you know going back hundreds of years and obviously knowing that Poland is, has always had quite a lot of anti-semitism I wasn't surprised that there weren't any Jews there it did feel a little peculiar being in a place that was home to tens of thousands of Jews and now there's almost nobody there. And going into shuls that were basically museums, yes, I mean, I think Mark said he, he went to a shul on the Friday night of the Shabbos, but, you know, th there's hardly anyone there. So it, it is a, quite a, an eerie feeling to think that there's no one there. It makes you think about where you were brought up yourself in Leeds and how this could happen to us today. That's how it, it felt inside me, you know, the, the reality of it. It doesn't really touch your soul until you see it properly. I mean, I've been to Yad Vashem and I've been to other museums, but being on the ground, it is absolutely... Mind-boggling. Mind yeah. And it's going to affect me for the rest of my life without any doubt at all. And anyone I see and speak to who mentions they're interested, I will be telling them that they have to go as a duty if they believe themselves not only to be a Jew, but to be a human being. I think that's the thing. It's the inhumanity that got to us mm -hmm. of man to man that you could never visualise that people could be so cruel. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Richard, thank you very much for coming in and talking to us. Um, and... I think hopefully during the programme today we're going to try and just get the odd thoughts from other people as well that were on the trip. It's affected all of us. It has affected us. There's only very few people that I knew on the trip and obviously there are a lot of, of our non-Jewish friends there and initially it was all a bit disjointed but as the hours and days passed the group became quite a solid unit and we're all feeling exactly the same emotions at the same times and... Uh, 
it was quite a, an emotional experience the few days and I'm extremely glad that I went. I'm joined now by Ian Mox in Israel. Hello, Ian. Good afternoon. Just to talk to you about Poland. Um, and you came with your mum? Yeah. We, we both originally from Leeds many years ago and we both wanted to do such a trip. And when I was talking to Stephen Paxter to Simcha earlier in the year, he mentioned about it and I said to mum, you know, let's, let's go for it. We're glad we did. You but went, I'm, first of all, to Warsaw, didn't you? Because it started early on a Sunday morning, we, we couldn't get there physically for then. So we went to Warsaw for the weekend and was very moved by Warsaw as well. 80% of the whole of Warsaw was destroyed. And we went to the Shul on Shabbat morning and it was sad. There was, there was 22 men there, including me, <gasps> and eight ladies. You brought with you from Israel soil... From, was it from Jerusalem? The custom in Israel is when you go to visit a person that's departed or a loved one, you take a stone with you and just put a stone as a memorial piece on the, on the, on the ground. Yeah, that's stone. the custom here too, to be right, fair. Okay. And Jewish, yeah. So we, ac we actually brought some soil from Israel and some, Jeru some stone from Jerusalem. And we put it when we had the final ceremony at Auschwitz and we also put it in at the ceremony we had in one of the forests. Yeah, I need to go to the, to the ceremony in the forest where there was, uh, I think, 10,000 people were murdered in the forest. <laughs> Eric, Eric's actually going mm -hmm, in the background here. We were all terribly overcome by the fact that the very last bit of that was where the children had been because they were separated, weren't they? Yeah. And then they were killed. And I think you, you seemed to be, well, you were massively I, overcome that, at that, that stage. That, that moved me very much so, obviously as a father. And the guy, Mark, the educator that was with us, I think was also moved because I don't know why I did it, but on Shabbat, where after Kiddush, I always bless my children. And I just blessed the children then. You I did. don't know why. But you did. It was, it, was, it was where the kites were, wasn't it? And the... Yeah, that's right, that's right. And yeah, when I'm we were in Auschwitz, as also I remember, there were areas that you felt you just couldn't go and look I, at. I, I, I'm a big, strong guy, and uh, yes. I'm a big softy, really. There was one part that's in the museum where there was two tons of human hair, and I just couldn't... I, I, I walked out. I couldn't take that, personally. Uh, the same with the shoes and the spectacles and the false legs and things like that. Those, I felt, were animate objects belonging to individual people. The fact that there were, afterwards there was hairbrushes and pots and pans didn't bother me. But these were two tons of human hair. I just couldn't get my head around. I, and I, I, I walked out. You did. Stood outside. Yes, I, can I couldn't take that. that. We've just interviewed Richard Rose, and he said the time that he's had in Poland has actually stayed with him and affected him. Do you feel yes. this now that you've gone back home to Israel? Yes, yes. I mean, my daughter went on a school trip and we, we, we've had conversations about it. My son's going on a school trip when they reach the 12th grade. He's going next year. So we're talking about it within the family. It, it did affect us. And I'm the sort of guy that I'm not Shomre Shabbat, but I walked around with a kippah on. From the moment I left my house in, in, in Netanya to the coming back to the house, I had a kippah on all the time because I wanted to prove a point to the, especially to the Poles, Either, you know, there were good Poles and there were bad Poles, but you tried to kill our people, and I'm living proof that you didn't do. Absolutely. What about the mix of the being Jews and non-Jews? I think that that I was... I think that was, uh, that was great. The, the non-Jewish people will go back and will talk, uh, even if it's just socially or whatever, that what happened in, in Europe in the 40s was, was a terrible, terrible thing. As a result, Israel was born, and you know, their impressions of Jews and of Israel, I think, changed substantially as a result of this trip. And what about Mum, Marilyn? How does she fare since she's gone back? She, and she kept thinking about things thereafter, and I'm sure she had a little tear here and there. Yes, especially at the very last bit, I think, before we left Birkenau, we, we had a, a small ceremony, and um, it, it, was, it was extremely moving. And your mum and, and I were sort of linking arms and were quite yeah. sort of thoughtful and yet we, we felt we, we were giving each other the support that, that we needed. And the, the, there was one non-Jewish lady that came when she wanted to put the soul down as well, which I thought was quite special as far as she was concerned. Absolutely, absolutely. Ian, thank you very much for speaking to us okay. today. Um, and um, Thank you for, the, for your time. Thank you very much. OK, bye. Bye. 
And I'm now speaking to Pat Hunter. Hello, Pat. Hello, Leslie. Thank you for speaking to us today. I know it's very busy. Um, you are headmistress of Rosset School. I am, in indeed. In Harrogate. Yeah. Um, and when I wrote to you um, and asked you if you'd come on the programme, you said you were gradually distilling all your thoughts. Yes. So have you distilled your thoughts? And what do you still have with you from our trip to Auschwitz? Well, they are still distilling, and uh, it, it's been interesting actually coming back to to work because obviously a lot of people have said, "Well, how was the trip?" And you know, it's very difficult to explain to people how. Well, you it can't was. say I've had a wonderful time. You can't, and actually, you know, people know that. I think what I've said to people and what I'm thinking myself is that actually it was such a worthwhile experience. I think it was particularly interesting on, on several levels for myself going with a group of people, you know, I'm not Jewish, but going with people who are Jewish, people who are Christians. And to get different perspectives and the dialogue was, was, was very, very interesting, useful, challenging at times. So have you had chance to sort of debrief to the people within the school, either the teaching staff or the students? What's your move next within the school to try and give them an overview of what happened when you were in Poland? I think what, what I've been thinking about is doing some assemblies, um, not straight away, but probably to coincide with the January Holocaust Memorial Day after, after the Christmas break. And some of the things I've been thinking about is also what a great privilege it was to have uh, Eric Hirsch with us to really get completely first-hand and what a kind of humbling experience that was for me personally and to try and get that across to young people. Because I think actually the classes that I teach were very interested and you know, tried to tell them a little bit, but obviously didn't want to distract from the teaching. So to do that in some assemblies. And will you use photographs or not? I think what I'd like to do, yes, is some of the photographs that I've got and some of the um, video footage. Also, Jacob Pachter, who is a student at my school who went on the youth group last summer, he did a really lovely um, PowerPoint of his thoughts. And I want to talk to him about using some of his images and his thoughts because actually that gives a sort of youth perspective as well which I think is, is, is quite important when getting things across to young people. Absolutely. I mean, will you encourage members of your sixth form and also your teaching staff to, to go? I already said actually just this week, um, I said a little bit more in my staff briefing about how it had been and the one thing I said is that I, I do feel that it's something that every adult should do in their lives it's a sort of given because it's a reminder of the things that should never ever happen again and i have said that i'd happily support members of staff who would want to to go on the trip and i've had one or two who said they'd be interested in finding out a little bit more um, about the march trip so yes definitely and was there anything that really stuck with you from the whole trip Something that you've gone over and over, because I certainly have had. Mm. I mean, I felt the memorial to the children in the forest was something that's, that has stayed with me. And the fact of the whole of that area where, you know, there was just leaves scattered everywhere. And, and then people were just living, you know, in houses mm. at the side of it as if, you know, nothing had happened. Mm. The fact that, the, you know... There were 10,000 graves at the side I of know, them. I know, I know. I thought I did find that particularly harrowing and quite difficult to deal with. I think, I think we all felt that, didn't we, in, in, Absolutely. in, in our different ways. And, you, and you're so right. You, we, when we walked away and you suddenly looked at those beautiful houses that were just a stone's throw, stone's throw away they? from it. And actually it, people had built them. They were new. Yes. Which was quite a, uh, a phenomenon. I know. I, I think one of the other lasting images for me and the thing which actually uh, strangely moved me, well, it, it is a strange thing, but it, it did, was actually the hair in the, um, in the museum. Yes, yeah. Ian Marks, who we've interviewed before, he said that he actually couldn't go into that. No, room. I know. I spoke to him outside about that. I mean, that was particularly difficult, but also I think for me it was seeing all those 
brushes and shoe brushes and polish, those tins of polish. And I just thought, those people packed up and packed up their shoes and packed up and thought, thought they'd even have time to polish their shoes. To polish their shoes you know? if they had them. Absolutely. And that, for me, that kind of conveyed a level of human dignity, I suppose, that they wanted to... To maintain. To maintain Absolutely. some sort of standard semblance of normal living, and yet only probably hours after those things had been packed up, they were no longer living. And I thought that sort of really really kind of got to me you know sort of that, that human side Absolutely. they didn't really know what they were going to and so what what do you pack in your suitcase when you're going and the suitcases somewhere? and they've got their names on them I know. I mean, amazing yeah. pat yeah. thank you very much Pleasure. for giving us the time today in your very busy timetable that's okay and, nice uh, to talk to you and you thank yeah. you okay thanks then bye-bye and now to my next guest phil gilstone hello phil hello leslie good morning we've heard a lot about what was going on when we were on our trip but I wanted to know from you because you were traveling with your son and yeah. and that again is a different aspect of of the journey have you and Johnny discussed this together since you got home yes we have uh, not that I've seen a great deal of it because well, as soon as he came back he had to go back to work Absolutely. and uh, does his thing obviously it was Good to go with my son. I've got uh, a son and a daughter, but I know this son is... But Johnny, my youngest one, is particularly interested in Jewish life and Jewish history. And uh, to go together, I think for us, as a father and son, was very important. It uh, you know, somewhat helped to develop our relationship, which I think is very important. But also it gave him, I think, an understanding of... I think something that Richards has said that about our looking and seeing our history in actuality, uh, as opposed to reading it in uh, in books and seeing maybe television, film, etc. about about the Holocaust. Uh, to actually be there together was very important. What about when you got home? Have you discussed it with the rest of the family? Oh yes, we in fact we went through last weekend uh, with all that family. We went through all the pictures that Johnny took and we explained to them the actual uh, places we went to see and why it was done in that order, and we, we went through the whole trip with them. We were talking as well before we started recording that um, obviously we've been in a mixed group of both Jews and non-Jews, um, and there was quite a large contingent from St George's Church, wasn't there? And I believe that you are actually going to be involved. They've asked you to come and talk. Yeah, they, uh, I think it was David who was there, I think not... That their, their actual leader, but the senior member of the church who was on, on the trip with us, contacted me last week and asked me if I'd like to come along to a meeting. I think it, it's, a, it's a week on Monday. They're having a review of uh, their experience and talking to their congregation about this trip to Auschwitz and also the previous trip they've made to Israel and the West Bank. And they asked me if I would be interested in giving a short presentation to them on the sort of Jewish view and the Jewish aspect of and how do you think experience. you're going to, to sort of put that forward? Your views are uh, obviously very strong on it. Oh, they are strong, and uh, I think I'm just going to... depends on how they want me to do it when I get there, but I'm not going to prepare anything in great detail. I'm going to talk as we would talk and uh, give them a view, tell them what I thought and how it uh, has maybe influenced my views ongoing and my son's view and my family's view. And what are your lasting memories? I've looked at this, at the Holocaust. It's an interest of mine, modern history, modern European history, particularly Jewish modern history. And I have a view, but to go actually go and walk on the same ground as these people walk to their eventual death, it was, was, was quite something extraordinary. It's an honour. Mm. I, I saw it in Dinsing Love as a, as a, in a sense, standing with Eric on the ramp that we all stood on. In Birkenau, in some senses, I saw it as a uh, as a victory mm -hmm. for us, for the Jews, because the people who tried to wipe us out, they're not there. No, nope. their antecedents have disappeared. Their ideas, to a greater degree, I'm happy to say, I think have disappeared. But we were there, standing there proudly with non-Jewish people, to say, you know, we went through all this. We know others who weren't Jewish went through this. But we're back here to say, well, we come to see what they actually did and to say we're still, we're still around and you aren't. Phil, thank you very much indeed. 
I, I'm going to stop you there because it's really sort of got to me as well. Thank you very much for it's coming. It's a pleasure. Thank you for asking me. May I just say before we start to speak to Mark Lazar in Israel, who is the guy who was our tour guide, if we can call him that, but he was our person to take us through. Now, Mark, hello, Mark. Hi, how are you doing? I'm well. Um, you called it a short journey that we went together. It seemed an awful lot longer than a short journey. Have you taken a trip like this before with Jews and Christians? Uh, it's actually, uh, I've taken over 25 trips, uh, groups and journeys in Poland. This is the first time I had a mix of, uh, of Jews and non-Jews. Uh, how do you think it uh, went? So it, was, it was interesting for me. It was interesting. Do you think the mix was good? I think I think very good. I think it bonds people together. I think it brings people together, sh sharing uh, sharing the past, talking about what happened during the Holocaust, and uh, and definitely in terms of communication, community relations. I think I think it's a great idea. When we left you at the coach, I felt quite sad that you weren't coming back with us. You know, I felt you were part of us, and how dare you yeah, not I come back to also. England with us? Yeah, for me, it's always. Uh, it, it is a big emptiness when I work with the group. I, I tend to get, I try to be open uh, emotionally and psychologically with the group as well. I tend to get very close, and all of a sudden there's this, there's this void. And in this case, where I said goodbye to you by uh, when you left on the bus, Krakow, I, I stayed there. I thought, what do we do now? What just happened? Yes. Um, we really came together as a group so well. I think because we had so much shared emotion, of what we experienced, and then the being with Arik, uh, which is amazing to hear his personal story and to be with him and to to try to even imagine what happened on his journey to the different places uh, really pulled us all together very close. Well, when you talk about the shared emotion, what, it's the wrong word to use, but what was the high point of this, do you think? Where did you think that we all began to get together? I think we, we bonded fully um, the, the second day when we, um, when we were at the, the forest area where um, there was a children's memorial, where the memorials for Jews and non-Jews that had been uh, basically placed in pits and shot. And when we got to the Children's Memorial, I think at that point we'd all been hit so hard in the gut. It was such an emotional experience to think about what actually happened there. Um, and, and, and again, a sight that was Jews and Christians, both from the city of Tarnoff, that were uh, taken out by the, uh, the Nazis and executed there. I think, I think that, for me, you know, I just felt we really came together. And we, when we did a little time, a little uh, uh, shot of uh, schnapps, a little alcohol on the bus, a little afterwards, just to say, let's breathe in some light right now. Absolutely. I think, I that, think was, it was, that was a moment we were I think it was with. Ronnie and Ian got off the coach and, and went and bought us yes, a, yes. a schnapps There's and a we all had little had cups and we all did a lachaim, which was yeah. a most amazing moment um, for everybody, I think. And yeah, I think so too. Presumably the next one that you're doing, are you going to go with them again? Will you go with them? Uh, I'm going actually um, in a week and a half. A week from Friday I fly mm -hmm. to Riga in Latvia, and I work with uh, young Madrakim, young uh, counselors who are going to work with Jewish youth in uh, Latvia. For a weekend with them, then I fly there to Warsaw, and I meet a group of uh, people from Jewish Community Center executives from North America that are coming on a pilot trip. They're going to spend about about five days there, although we're going to try to cover a little more territory, and they're looking to see if it's something they want to start offering the Jewish Community Centers, the JCC in America. So, so I'm back really soon, but won't be with ARC this time, but I'm Hopefully with Arik, there's talk of a trip in March, March yes. and possibly with youth next year in October. I feel it's an honor to, to do it in a lot of ways because it's, um, for me, it's, it's, it's I hate, not in a religious sense, but it's holy work. And we're dealing with such a delicate issue. And to be the conduit to go with people and try to be there to help process it or lead it or give contemplation to it, and hopefully to help people remember what happened and internalize that into a value that makes a difference now about caring about other human beings here and now, I mean, I feel it's really special work. I mean, sometimes I, you know, I, I just need to be alone in the evening because I... Absolutely. I've, I've put myself too much into the readings and the place and thought about it, and it's, it's, it's really a dark, deep pit. Thank you very much, Mark, for talking to us today. Oh, and, it was an uh, honor. Thank you for Listen to Radio Jcom on the internet at www.radiojcom.com next week. Great, I will check it out. Thank you. Bye.
that concludes my program today and thank you for joining me and my guests. You've been listening to Leslie's Today program broadcasting on 1386 on the medium wave and www.radiojcom.com. The program has been brought to you by me, Leslie Millett, and produced, as always, by Stuart Wolfe, our station manager. Please join me again soon.